Okay, welcome to Monday Night Bible Study. We'll continue in our study in Romans, Romans chapter 14. Uh, we uh, looked at some interesting things here. We got through a few verses last week. We'll just kind of run through those pretty quick. And it won't take a long time to review any of that. Just kind of a reminder uh, that we want to remember the cultural context of what we're looking at here because different world these folks lived in from what we do and what we're used to. Also keep in mind the aspects of God's covenant with Noah, which all of us are under. Gentiles, we always were under, and we still are about our provision, and God has provided the earth for our provision, resources, and so forth. And uh, Paul goes, goes over some things about uh, how to uh, treat each other and, and our attitude towards other folks that may not have the level of understanding we do about certain things as far as, you know, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. In other words, someone that's maybe a little weaker in the faith and so on. Uh, and we should uh, accept them and so forth. And he explained some things about some people don't eat meat. Uh, we talk about why, because the whole thing with the shambles and the meat in the meat markets, and it was often most often uh, sacrificed to idols and so those that were in Christ didn't want to have anything to do with that uh, so they really kind of went to an extreme but they wouldn't eat meat at all other folks knew that you know it really didn't mean anything it was just meat and so they, they would eat it and then there were some conflicts there and he talked about the same thing in 1 Corinthians over there uh, and it really kind of goes in more detail and explains a lot of that. Which really, some of these things that we've looked at in Romans, I know we've taken a long time, we've gone into a lot of detail over it, but some of it is really kind of an outline that Paul goes on to explain further in some of his other letters and books. Um, and uh, it comes down to these, you know, whether... Therefore, you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, and so forth. And, uh, and then he says, be ye followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. So this, that's where we kind of made it to last week. Uh, <clears throat> let's look at a reminder from back in chapter 12. And it really, as we're going through, really from here on through the rest of the book, we need to keep in mind, a lot of the things Paul talked about over there in chapter 12, we can refer back to, and we should refer back to, because remember, he's giving us a picture there that basically, look, when the, when the body is functioning properly, these are some things that you should see happening there. So uh, here's a reminder. And this is really key for, for all of us dealing with each other in the body of Christ. <clears throat> Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. So let love be without hypocrisy. Uh, it, you know, uh, in, in this sense, and you know, that usage of the word, we, uh, hypocrisy or a, a hypocrite is kind of come to have a little different meaning now than what it did in its original context, <clears throat> a hypocrite was basically a play actor, somebody that was pretending to be something that they really weren't. Now, if love, if there was hypocrisy involved in love between some people, that would indicate that one or the other of the people were pretending to, you know, love the people, but they really weren't. They were just putting on a show. They were just play acting. And that's that's very easy to do. Uh, in fact, you know, we find that a lot in religious circles. And I, I'm talking about the cults, like the Jim Jones type cults. Uh, man, they're all about love and loving one another and, and showing, you know, love for people and doing all this stuff and uh, uh, taking care of people and they talk a lot about it, you know, love this and that, and they love everybody and all that. <clears throat> but uh, when when it comes, uh, it's it's end result, it's fruit 
is usually destructive or manipulative or uh, abusive in some way. You know, it's one of the things about a, a lot of times abusive people, they, uh, they always claim to love the, or usually love the people that they're abusing, you know, and all that. So, uh, but it, especially in this context of, of people, believers in the body of Christ, growing in grace and growing spiritually, learning the word, learning to function properly in the body. It says, our love for each other <clears throat> should be without hypocrisy. Now, really, mainly, our love for one another, but even love for those on the outside. Now, here, here's something that, that's going to let us off the hook. There, and a lot of the religious circles will never say this or never admit this, but uh, the fact of the matter is, there can be some brothers and sisters in Christ you, you really don't love very much. <laughs> you know? There are some people, it, it, brothers and sisters in Christ, you just may not like them very much. Different personality types and whatever, you know. So we have to remember, okay, what, what's going to be first our definition of love and how that works out? And remember what we talked about before as we were working through chapter 12 and coming into chapter 13. And our definition of godly love in this context of what Paul's teaching us about, it, love is to value and esteem what God values and esteems. Because we can, we can do that with brothers and sisters in Christ or even unbelievers we can value and esteem them the way God values and esteems them, which is love in a godly sense, without feeling a lot of affection for them, you know, things like that. Uh, because love is not always the gushy, affectionate, warm, you know, uh, emotional outpouring that we commonly think about it being, you know. And love is like forgiveness. Sometimes there are different levels of it, you know. Uh, like we've talked about forgiveness. For some people, about the only level of forgiveness they may be able to reach with another person is to not retaliate against them if they had the opportunity to. You know, just let it go and... and Move on. Let it go. So, our, 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 our loving somebody, our valuing and esteeming somebody the way God values and esteems them may be showing them mercy, an act of kindness, generosity, some, something, you know, that we can do for them. Uh, or, if we understand the different uh, personality types and the... Uh, you know, the the whole love language thing about some people are verbal, some people are physically affectionate, some people are, are gifters, and things like that. If we're aware of those things, which, you know, we should be, uh, at least the basic fundamentals of it, then we'll know how to, without hypocrisy, value and esteem others the way God values and esteems them. And that's a, a really good definition of godly love for us to keep in mind. How often do we see hypocrisy in what is called love in a lot of places? And I'm not just picking on churches, but we do see a lot of it there. Oh, I just, you know, love you, love everybody, and the bull. You know, it's bull. We know it's hypocrisy. It's play acting. Because that's what we're supposed to do, you know. Uh, but we shouldn't have that. And then abhor what is evil. Now, just like godly love is to value and esteem what God values and esteems, we're every bit justified to abhor what is evil. Why? Because who abhors what's evil? God does. You know, a lot of times 
We forget that everything that is evil, God hates it. And I know in the, in the back of our minds, and verbally for a lot of people, they say, and sometimes if we admit it, I'll admit it, we think, you know, if God hates evil, why does he do something about it? Well, what we have to remember is that from our limited perspective of things, it may seem like God's not doing anything about it. But if we could back up and get the broader view and see things from God's perspective, He is doing something about it. Plus, another important thing that we need to remember, and this is going to come to play here uh, a few verses ahead down the, in the chapter, is that one of our key things we got to remember over there in 2 Corinthians 5. God is not imputing our trespasses against us. So for us that are saved, that are in Christ, and we know we're forgiven because God has not imputed the guilt of our trespasses against us. What did He do with them? He put them on Christ. He, he, that's how He dealt with them. They didn't just go undealt with. He didn't just, you know, ignore it or whatever. No, it, it was dealt with effectively, but he, Christ dealt with it. So by that, uh, we, we're reconciled to God because our, our sins were dealt with there on the cross in Christ. Um, so he's not imputing our sins against us. Well, the thing is, even for unbelievers, even for evil people, uh, he's not imputing their sins against them uh, in that he's not pouring out immediate judgment and wrath on people that do evil things. He lets that play out throughout you know, their life because from what I understand, what Paul teaches us, the Bible teaches us, as long as a person is alive, they have the opportunity to hear the gospel of Christ, and repent of their sins, and believe and be saved. So anyway, uh, but God does, make no mistake, God abhors everything that is evil. And the day will come that He will effectively deal with all evil things. So abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. And uh, we, we, have, you know, we have a lot of... Uh, uh, in other places, Paul goes into a lot of these, spells it out, things that, you know, are good. We have the criteria for that and cling to those things. So, in, in this, this goes back to what we saw earlier in Romans 12, where we, we came to that kind of a, a crossroads, that watershed in the study. It was like a milestone in the study where Paul tells us, not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And he begins to give us some other things about godly thinking and godly living and godly laboring. Now, these things come from godly thinking. That's a result of that. Because we, we have to think about these things. We have to make some judgments about these things. And we have to have godly wisdom and exercise godly judgment to discern between what is evil and what is good. And why do we need that discernment? Because remember, what we just covered back in chapter 13 about casting off the works of darkness. And Satan's darkness consists of a cleverly crafted set of deceitful counterfeits that are designed to take the place of God's truth and His good things. So, uh, in Satan's world, the things that look the things that are evil look good. And the things that are good look evil. And <laughs> just like in you know, the world today, things are turned upside down. They call evil good and good evil. So it takes godly discernment and wisdom and good judgment and thinking to, to discern between these two and, and to carry this out. Children can't do this. This is why Paul's gone through all that teaching us about our maturity and walking in the Spirit and, uh, uh, you know, what our, 
Adoption as sons consists of, and getting us started on that, and uh, making sure that we, we understand those concepts. And that's how God's dealing with us. That's how He's working with us, and that's what He intends to do. And understanding that is the key to then moving on in a maturity where we can then do these things. These operational, functional things of our walking in Christ. And then he says, uh, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. And this is, I mean, doesn't need a lot of uh, explanation. But we do want to remember that Paul is always writing to believers. You know, this is really not applicable to unbelievers. It wouldn't be any good if they did that. Even though a lot of times, you know, we, we see unbelieving people kind of doing these things. It's not really that hard to, you know, to do, to live that way. But in uh, these things in chapter 12, he's telling us because he knows what he's going to tell us over here in, four, in chapter 14, what we're looking at now about these specific things about, look, if one of you believes it's okay to eat meat, Eat meat, that's fine. you got a, a weaker brother that believes they shouldn't eat meat at all in order to make sure they don't eat meat sacrificed to idols, then you got to be okay with that. And don't put them down because they believe that they shouldn't eat meat. That's okay. That's, you know, what they believe, then you got to be okay with that. And that, and that is built off what he's told us over here. These are the things you'll see when the body's properly functioning. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. And, and of course, brotherly love, showing a kinship, which we all are, and they, Jew or Gentile, no matter what, in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a kinship. And so, not just value and esteeming what God values and esteems, but even to a higher level with a kinship, valuing, valuing and esteeming another, each other as God does in Christ with a kinship in Him. Back to Romans 14. So he goes on to say, Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, Yea, he should be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. It's because we have a new identity in Christ, an inheritance with him, and our trespasses are not imputed unto us. So, talking about judging another man's servant, remember that, uh, you know, each of us belongs to Christ. And we're, which Paul's about to go into, our... Our relationship directly is with Him. Our accountability is with Him. Uh, also remember that there's no, <clears throat> there's no hierarchy in the body of Christ. That all of us, and there are you know, different offices in the body, there are different gifts and manifestations of the gifts and uh, different abilities among the different people in the body. Some are in leadership positions, some are not. But none have the right of or justification to lord it over anybody else. There's no hierarchy uh, in the body of Christ. There never was supposed to be. There's not supposed to be now. So when we have these big religious hierarchies, that's a pretty good indication, one of the main indications that that is some form of religion that has gotten way off track at some point and wound up, you know, where they are, part of a vain religious system. So, uh, not judging somebody else's servant. So you, you know, you don't. Uh, uh, all right, back in those days, they had servants, they had slaves. These are, you know, Romans living in Rome. They say that, uh, you know, in 1st, 2nd century Rome, there were more slaves than there were citizens in Rome. They had servants for everything. All kind of household servants and working servants and all that. Well, it, you know, if, if I had a, a servant 
to do something and you know you wouldn't then go and really uh, you know judge the actions of my servant or their how they did their job or any of that because basically it's none of your business so this is Paul in really in a kind of a nice way saying look somebody else's walk with Christ is really none of your business let Christ take care of it. He'll take care of that. And Paul could justify to say that because he knew, well, he was giving them the instructions that all of us have for following Christ. Male, female, rich, poor, slave, free, didn't matter. All of it applies and all of it works. So, anyway. So let God handle His own business, basically. Kind of what he's saying. Another subject. He talked about eating, you know, meat. Some ate meat, some ate meat, some didn't. Now he talks about different days. And remember, they had a lot of Jewish believers that still followed the Jewish feast days and the Jewish customs and the traditions and all that. And which, that's what they, they were Jewish. What do you expect them to do? You know, and just throw all that away. That was their whole life. But a lot of them were coming to understand how those things related to Christ. And they were using those things to teach the Gentiles things they needed to know. Uh, but then there were others who didn't observe those feasts and so forth. It says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he does not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So, as far as keeping certain days, maybe back in, even in Paul's day, maybe they had some concern over what day of the week they should meet for worship. Now, we know that most of them met in their homes. Uh, they may have all pretty much met on a certain day of the week. We generally think it's the first day of the week. Now, in the Roman culture, there are reasons to believe that that was the day that they met. Kind of like Sunday. Or this is where, you know, uh, Sunday came in. A lot of the reason why uh, uh, for the day of Christian worship. And that had a lot to do with, if, if I understand this correctly, and I, I think I've got this right, the way the, the way the Roman work week was set up, basically they worked, they did business six days a week, uh, Monday through Saturday. Now, at the, you know, at the end of the week, they uh, totaled up all of their business for the week, uh, everybody got paid and so forth, they took Sunday off. Well, that, you know, that became their day of meeting uh, there because they weren't busy doing anything else. That kind of had something to do with why they began to meet there. The Jewish believers, on the other hand, continued to meet on the Sabbath day, on Saturday. Well, I'm sure there was probably some conflict because there, there were people then that believed, just like a lot of people do today, that they should meet for worship on the Sabbath day. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people today that, that they worship on Saturday. You know, seventh day, this and that. Uh, and really, if that's what they want to do, then that's fine. But the problem is, if they turn that into some legalistic principle to where they want to hammer other people with it and say, well, you're not really, truly worshiping God if you're not worshiping on Saturday because Saturday is the original Sabbath day and blah, 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 blah. Well, if they're going to go down that road, then they need to go all the way down that road. And if they're going to take, you know, the Sabbath worship and hold the body of Christ to that, that they need to worship on Saturday because it's the Sabbath, then they need to take everything else that goes with the Sabbath too, which is all the feast days and all of the laws and all that. You don't you don't go in there and it's not like you know going to Luby's where you pick and choose what you want and all that or, or you know 
uh, Golden Corral or somewhere where it's a buffet line and you can just go through there and pick what you want. No. If you're going to take part of that, you know, legalistic stand, then you got to take all of it. Now, if a group wants to meet on Saturday, they want to meet on Friday, whatever day of the week, it doesn't matter. Especially for us Gentiles. Paul explained this quite well. Remember Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, where he says, At that time you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, without God and without hope in the world. So as Gentiles, we never were under any of that. Laws, Sabbath keeping, or any of that, anyway. So for us it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, you can worship on Monday night if you want to. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So, that's the kind of point Paul's making. So look, don't hammer each other about what day you meet. Because big picture, what he's teaching us is that, that look, you know, first of all, it's not a one day of the week thing. And that's part of the wrong track that religion got off on. And they turned it into this once a week ritualized thing that became, it was an error and a, a counterfeit that became firmly established that, well, you know, Saturday or Sunday or whatever day it is, that's when we go and we do the God thing, the religious thing, and the rest of the time that's just, you know, normal life, regular life. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. The way it's supposed to be is that every day, all the time, is where, and I'm not talking about going around, you know, like fanatics and everything, but where we're, we're, we're walking in the Spirit, living in Christ all the time. And see, when, uh, I think it's one reason why when the Lord set up the church, the body of Christ, He made it focused on the home. Not on some cathedral somewhere, some centralized location. And sometimes they had that and had centralized meetings. But it was focused around the home because he knew people are going to live there. And when that home is focused around um, the teaching of the Word and the functioning of the body and, and the, their, you know, people are learning and growing and duplicating that, and so forth, then it, it will work as it's supposed to. And it's an, it's an everyday thing. It's a life, a lifestyle. Not just a once a week occurrence and so on. So, because for none of us lives, liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live under the Lord, and whether we die, we die under the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. <clears throat> Pointing out first that none of us, remember he's talking to people in the body of Christ, none of us just affects our self. Uh, you know, our life is not our own. We can remember other things Paul said of, about that, uh, uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain and so forth like that. Uh, the, the life that we now live, we live by faith and the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me and so forth like that. And uh, so on. Uh, whether we live, uh, we live unto the Lord and whether we die, which to them, remember, was a very real possibility or many of them, in the Roman world. In fact, after Paul wrote the letter of Romans, it must not have been very long until Emperor Claudius kicked all of the Jews out of Rome. And that was why Priscilla and Aquila met Paul in Ephesus, I think it was, somewhere. He, they, met, they met, maybe it was Corinth. Yeah, I think it was Corinth where he, he, he met them uh, after they've been kicked out of Rome. But whether we live or whether we die, uh, we're, we're the Lord's one way or another. And one way or another, it will, it will work out for our benefit because if we 
live in this world, uh, we, we're living in Christ. If we die, that's okay too, because we go to be with the Lord, and we know that we'll receive a resurrected body one day, and our, our life really hasn't ended. It, it will continue on. The physical body may die, but the spirit will, you know, live on and receive a resurrected body one day. Uh, and as our example, for to this end, Christ, the same thing, he didn't live to himself, he didn't die to himself, in his life he lived unto the Lord, his death he died unto the Lord, for that end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. This kind of goes back to some of the things we've talked about that happened, amazing things that happened at Christ's crucifixion. Um, that, okay, there are scriptures, I can't remember specifically uh, where is that scripture, anyway, indicates to us that it was necessary It was necessary for Christ to die. Well, one of the reasons for that is because, if you remember earlier, and this has been a good while back, we mentioned it every now, every now and then. If you remember back when we were talking about the covenants, there's the Davidic covenant and then the Messianic covenant. Well, in the Messianic covenant, uh, well, let me, let me just put it right here. I know it's going to be kind of small, but it says Redeemer. Okay, under the Messianic Covenant, there were five things that Christ would be and that He would fulfill. If you ever notice, and I don't know if all Bibles do this, but, but a lot of Bibles, if you look in the Psalms, you'll notice it's divided into five parts. Well, those five, it's divided into those five parts for, for a specific reason. It's because each one reflects one of the offices or purposes of Christ as the Messiah. And this Redeemer up here, there's Deliverer. And remember, this is all for Israel. As Paul told us, Christ was the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made to the fathers. A deliverer, avenger, uh, king, and blesser. These are the five redeemer. I'm going to put that up there. These are the five offices of the, uh, of the Messiah. These are Full, five things that he will fulfill. The reason we got Redeemer up here because he has fulfilled this one already for everybody, not just not just for Israel, but for us as well. Uh, he's fulfilled Redeemer. These other four: Deliverer, Avenger, King, and Blesser. He has not fulfilled yet. He will fulfill when he returns and sets up his kingdom. He'll be Israel's deliverer. He'll be their Avenger. He'll be their king, and he'll be, he'll be their blessing. Now, in David, we see aspects of, of all five of these. If you think back over David's life, some of the things he did, he, uh, he, he was a picture of the Messiah, of Christ, in uh, these five areas in his dealing with Israel as well. So, uh, these five things Christ will do when he returns, and he'll fulfill these. Now, because of the powerful supernatural aspect of the, him fulfilling these four characteristics of the Messianic Covenant, <clears throat> this one, Redeemer, he could do as a man. In fact, he had to be a physical man, a sinless physical man, in order to pay the price for sins. To be the perfect 
and sufficient sacrifice for sins on the cross. So in that, it took a, a, a real, a physical man, yet a sinless man. He fulfilled that then. Now, uh, once that was, that was done, or even, see, he had to be a redeemer first. Now, he couldn't have really fulfilled all of these unless it was in the form of a resurrected, powerful, supernatural Son of God. So you can see a lot of the, just the genius in the working and a lot of the other many, many things that happened in Christ's finished work on the cross. And so because he is resurrected, he is now able to return and fulfill these four aspects of the Davidic covenant, which he will one day. Uh, I'll try to remember to bring a, I, I've got with me somewhere here a list. I never can remember them right off the top of my head, nearly but not quite, the, the divisions in the Psalms. Your Bible may have it. Some of them divide those into the, the five parts. But if it doesn't, I'll try to remember to bring that next time. Yeah, it's very interesting to look at. And, and it's one of those things that uh, it, it, it really opens up a lot of understanding of a lot of things in the Bible. This, you know, those kind of simple concepts like that. That's part of rightly dividing the word. Okay. So Christ our example. But in that, here's, here's where I was going with all that. In order to be the, the Lord of the living and the dead, he uh, it was necessary for him to experience death, but then conquer death. And he took the power of death away from Satan who had the power of death. And so now, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ has all power and authority over all things. He has the ability to command the dead and command the living. Remember one of the things Jesus told his disciples. He said, you know, the day will come and when all they that are in the grave will hear his voice and will come forth, you know, and so forth. So, he's the Lord of the living in the dead. And this is an assurance to us because if we die, uh, then, you know, we don't have to worry about that because our physical death is not a barrier for Christ. It's something we can't overcome. We cannot overcome that barrier of death. And man never will be able to. I don't care how scientifically advanced uh, he becomes, he will never be able to overcome that barrier of death. That uh, You know, we can bring a person back if they had a heart attack or something, but that's within a certain time. After a certain amount of time goes by, that's it. They ain't coming back. <laughs> you shock them all you want to. It's not going to do any good. And we can't take, you know, you can't go and take a, a chicken at the store and you know, make it come back to life again. We can't do that. So, he goes on to say, figure it out. Yeah, we can, I think we can. I don't want to have to stop at the wrong point. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? Because, you know, they eat meat or don't eat meat or you know, observe this day or don't observe that day or whatever. Uh, why, why, you know, judge them that way or why do you set them at naught? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. I think that's in Isaiah, a quote from, from Isaiah there. And uh, here again, Paul's making a statement here that puts everybody on the same ground, the same level. In a kind of a nice, tactful way, he's saying, look, mind your own business because we're all servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, be careful about, you know, um, and remember, in 
the, the judgment here is not just in so much of, you're wrong, we shouldn't do it, you're wrong, but in kind of judging their, their, their motives or, or uh, establishing value to them. And if we're establishing a wrong value to somebody, what are we not doing? We're not valuing and esteeming them the way God values and esteems them. Godly love in action. So, he says, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. This will happen. And, you know, those of us who are in Christ, we can think, I'm thankful to the Lord that I've already, you know, I've, I've done that. That's my practice. I gladly bow my knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and I, you know, gladly confess uh, that the Lord God is the Lord God Most High, Almighty, and so forth. Uh, and everyone will. Now, there's, there's a, a lot in this statement sometimes that there's some really interesting things to look at in there. One of the things about this statement, point that Paul's making, we won't go way into it here, but we will just talk about it a little bit. And the thing that, that we need to remember, and maybe this will help us in uh, answering some of the tough questions we may face, People ask us questions like, well, you know, why does God allow so much evil in the world? Why, why doesn't He stop it? Here's the thing. Again, we don't really have the ability to see things from God's full perspective. But the day will come when not only will every need bow to the Lord and confess that He is God. But there's more to it than that. The day will come when Satan himself will admit that only the Lord God Most High has the right to possess and rule over His possession of heaven and earth. And the, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When this happens, at that final judgment, when every knee bows and every tongue confesses, not one being, whether it's human or angel or principality or power, Satan himself or any of their hierarchy, none of them, no one is going to be forced in front of God and forced down on their knees and forced to confess to Him. But in a genius that is beyond what we can really imagine, in God's working of all things, when it all comes down to the end, all those unimaginably evil and evilly powerful principalities and powers and even Satan himself will come to the point where they will have to admit that they were wrong. And God is justified. And they're going to they're going to do it on their own, you know. And it is, it's going to be done in a way that those of us that are in Christ, we're going to see that. And it, it is going to be so amazing. It's just the intricate genius of how God put everything together. And all that stuff that we really didn't understand. And from our kind of short-sighted viewpoint, we think, man, why does God allow this kind of stuff to go on? We'll see. We'll see. That, you know, He did. And there's a reason why. And when it comes down to it, there will not be one being of any type that will not fully admit that God and God alone is worthy, man. 
that he's justified and he is worthy alone of worship and praise and he has all power and authority. So, Don't you think it probably like the judgment is when that will probably happen? Yeah. So when they're told where they're going, they're going to bow their knee. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. I, you know, because it's, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it, it will be, it won't be arguable. I, I don't think anybody's going to stand there before God and argue, well, I didn't deserve it. You know, they're going to see it. God is justified. John, God is justified. Because, because really, I mean, what, what point do we have to come to that, that, brings us to trust in and believe in Christ as our Savior. Do we not have to come to some point to where we say, God is justified in His condemnation of me? Because, you know, I'm a sinner. Even just by virtue that I'm a member of the human race, I'm a descendant of Adam, that makes me a sinner, and God is justified in condemning me. And, you know, thank God for His mercy and, and so on. So, uh, I mean, every every being will come to the point where they'll understand that, look, God is justified in what He's done and the judgments that He makes. So, yeah, yeah, I think so. It's going to happen with the, those last judgments. You know, great white throne judgment, I guess, when uh, you know when the uh, unbelievers are, uh, the dead you know, the dead arise and the unbelievers finally, their final judgment and so forth. You know, but when they when they bow the gate is still here when they bow their knee and then they start confessing God and he says, I do not know. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's just heartbreaking. Yeah, it is. It's so sad. It is. It is. It's it's you know uh, it, it's it's heartbreaking and frustrating to the point that, you know, you 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 wish you could just shout to people, hey, you know. Wake up! How could you? How could you not? It, it, I, all my life, it just frustrates me that it seems like people just don't think about it. You know, I mean, how could you even take the chance? <laughs> you know, because because here's one thing we absolutely know: this life is going to come to an end. You know, death is going to come, and. Once you pass that point, you go through that gate of death, you're not coming back. And, you know, it, it, everything's beyond your control at that point. Why would you even take the chance? You know, I just, uh, uh, man, I, I, you know, I don't know. But just, just how can atheists deny creation and, and God and... Just it's, look around. I mean, yeah. Well, the, the thing is, they have they've taken the counterfeit. They, you know, they have been taken in by that cleverly crafted set of untruths that work. I, I mean, they they work with human beings uh, to take the place of the truth, and you know, especially if, if a person is not willing to. Admit fault, I guess, or then they, they have to look for some way to explain things that doesn't include God. And the whole thing with evolutionary theory and any other theory that denies God as creator exists because they refuse to acknowledge God, the existence of God. So if we if if we if we make up our minds, and see, here's, here's the thing about creation. Everybody comes at it with a preconceived notion. Even we do. We come at God's Word and we come at creation from the standpoint of we believe that the heaven and earth were created by a divine being. So we look in what proves out to us to be His Word and we see evidence there of that. We see a suitable explanation of that. Because... You know, we believe that there's a God. Well, the atheist or the evolutionist has made up their mind that they're not going to believe it. They choose not to believe that any God or any supernatural exists. 
So when they start down that road, they have to have an explanation. Where did everything come from? How do you explain life and all that? Well, uh, let's see. What just happened by itself? Yeah, yeah, it happened by itself. So that, that's their explanation. And they'll stick to it because they, they, ref, they refuse to acknowledge God. Because see, if we acknowledge God as creator, then we have to acknowledge him as everything else. You know, And that what he, if what he said about creation is true, then what he says about everything else is true, including us. And if what he says about us is true, then we're sinners and we're accountable to him. That's the whole foundation of all of evolutionary theory and all of that uh, atheistic viewpoints and all of those things. The refusal to acknowledge God. So, you know, that's the road they choose to go down. And, you know, and that, that's why it's so important to understand over there in Romans 1. That's why we, we refer back to that a lot. It says, you know, Paul says there the the invisible things from the creation are, are clear and that they can see, um, and so on. So in that, they, they chose to then change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. So, that, you know, this started all the way back. And uh, Satan had his hand in it. He set the course for this world, and humanity has stayed on that course ever since. And uh, the whole time... There was a way out. God had his, you know, his prophets and his people, his word, and so on. And you know, it's sad but true. So I think we'll, uh, I think we'll stop right there tonight. That's a good place to, yeah, that's a good place to stop because I got some important things to talk about when we go from like verse twelve on into the rest of the chapter that we don't have time to cover tonight. So we'll stop right there. All right. Got anything? Anybody got any close? Appreciate everybody being here tonight. All right. Let's pray and we'll be just here.